Welcome everyone. My name is Leah Michella, and I am a fellow with Network 2020 Entrepreneurial Diplomacy Tunisia. And I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you all to this webinar, uh, where our group, who you see on your screen, is extremely excited to introduce a funding opportunity um, that we have developed in order to support Tunisian local actionable projects uh, that focus on economic growth and reducing regional disparity in Tunisia. Today, we are going to walk you through the details of Network 2020. So you will hear from our president, uh, Courtney, who is going to share with us a little bit about our goals and why we are so interested as an American nonprofit NGO uh, to really invest and support Tunisians on the ground uh, in developing their own projects. So we will hear from Courtney. We will also have the opportunity to learn a little bit about the work that this team has done uh, in partnership with Tunisians and Tunisian Americans in order to get to this point where we have decided to release 20,000 US dollars uh, to support one of these projects. So we'll hear some of the challenges that our team has seen while on the ground in Tunisia. And we will more importantly discuss the opportunities that we see going forward. Uh, you will also hear from our Tunisian advisors uh, a little bit about their work with Network 2020 and why this is so important. And then ultimately what is really, really essential is hearing from the folks who are in this group and who are attending this webinar uh, from all over the world and have the opportunity to answer the questions that you have about this funding opportunity. So we'll walk through the goals that we share, the timeline and the selection process that we are using, uh, but then also really welcome everyone in this conversation to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and we will do our best to answer those in uh, written form as well as live in conversation. So there'll be time at the end uh, to continue to answer all of those questions. But as they come up, please feel free to just drop them in the box and we uh, will be sharing those out and making sure that we can answer them. The one thing I will say is that uh, we recognize that we are all learning together. So all questions are welcome. Uh, there are no bad questions. We just want to know uh, what you're thinking so that we can help everyone on this call uh, submit a wonderful application for this funding opportunity. Uh, the other thing that I will say is if there are any technology challenges or if you can't hear me or if there's anything that you don't understand, uh, feel free also to ask us and we will do our best to help you. Uh, you see a full team here of panelists who will all be willing to help you to make sure that we can get those questions answered. Um, and then the other thing is that this session is being recorded. So if there is anything that you miss and you would like to go back to, or if one of your friends or colleagues needs to hear this information, you can feel free to share it with them. We will share the link out uh, from Network 2020 as well. So everyone can hear this. And we really encourage you to share it far and wide uh, because we want to be able to fund and support the best projects that we can. Very quickly, I want to introduce the team that you'll be hearing from today. Uh, first is the team of staff members and volunteers at Network 2020, uh, a US-based NGO. Uh, so on our team, we have Courtney, Brian, and Lila, who have all been working both in the background as project managers to get this together, as well have, as been on the ground in Tunisia to learn from individuals like everyone on this call about what the needs are and what the funding opportunity could be. As well as uh, you see me, I'm Leah, Pashaya, and Dario. You will hear from us. Uh, we have been fellows with the Network 2020 program um, some of us have been working abroad in the Middle East and North Africa for a while. Dario uh, is currently working at Columbia University in partnership with Open Startup Tunisia. And so we are incredibly excited uh, to share this new funding opportunity and uh, decide what could be. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Courtney, 
who is the president of Network 2020, who's going to share a little bit about our mission, how we decided Tunisia was somewhere where we wanted to focus on uh, and what this opportunity can look like. So Courtney, uh, it is all you. All right, thank you very much, Leah. Uh, welcome everybody. It's great to have uh, such a wonderful turnout today. Um, and it's exciting to be here. Uh, this is really the culmination of almost two years of work. And so I think it's the, the next big step. So I'll just give a brief introduction to Network 2020 so you have an idea of who we are and why we're even doing this. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization. We're based in New York and we're really a community that's um, interested in finding innovative research and solutions to challenges that lie in the international affairs realm. So we run a number, a number of programs um, uh, including this entrepreneurial diplomacy program that, that this RFP emerged from, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, but we're really looking, we try to bring together um, a really interesting group of um, emerging, established, and really entrepreneurial leaders from across sectors who are interested in learning more um, and applying that knowledge about what they, about what's happening in the rest of the world, whether it's macro level issues like climate change or things that have to do with financial flows um, to what's happening in, in individual countries um, like Tunisia. Um, we move to the next slide. Um, I'm showing this one, it's a little bit dated, but some of our programs, we, we run briefings that address issues of international affairs. And I show this only to say that, you know, we reach over I think we've reached over 100,000 people in over 100 countries. So we now have this bigger and broader network, which I think is an important piece when it comes to what we've done with the entrepreneurial diplomacy program. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, because this specific program is one where we take, where members from our, or participants from our network elect to take their own time and spend their own money to go to a country. And we went to Tunisia and you'll hear a little bit more about this. Um, to speak to a wide range of people in society from um, business leaders to civil society activists to um, political leaders across the spectrum. And so the aim there is really to understand, you know, what are some of the drivers, where solutions come from. And so it's from this, this particular network and the participants that went to Tunisia um, with Network 2020 over a year ago that we have the funding for this program. So the funding for this RFP is independent and it's coming from individuals who have a connection to Tunisia, who feel personally connected to Tunisia and want to see Tunisia succeed. And so um, or it's already succeeding, but want to um, really work uh, and um, push forward some of the solutions that we heard on the ground. And so I think that, um, that's just an important piece to understand where the funding is coming from. It's from these private individuals who, who are interested um, in Tunisia and have a connection. Um, and so this, that trip that we took is, um, it's situated in this larger approach. So we have this phase one where our fellows, Dario, Leah, and Pashea, um, along with Badis, did some interview-based research and um, for about a year to understand some of the challenges and issues and opportunities. And then the phase two, we took a group, this larger group that I mentioned to Tunisia in May and June of 2022. And then part of phase three is we um, assembled a group and you'll hear a little bit more about this to um, inform the design of the RFP. And so I think with that, um, I will uh, conclude just about, um, oh, just a little bit more about um, where, we, where we're coming from. So, We've settled on Tunisia with conversations with our advisory council, who are often retired diplomats or statespeople um, you know, high up in international affairs who have an understanding of some of the different trends. And so um, Tunisia came up several times as a country that is worth taking a look at. So we selected that in March of 2021 that we would be focused on there. And like I said, the participants from our network were self-funded when they traveled. Um, and several of the participants offered to donate funds for the project. Um, and so with that, I think I can probably conclude and turn this over to Badis, who will give a little bit more background on what we did in the country. So thank you, and over to you, Badis. Thank you, Courtney. So my name is Badis Karboul, and I have 
been uh, with the Kinesia advisor for Network 2020, which is a New York City-based NGO, like Courtney stated. So I was involved in the Entrepreneurial Diplomacy Fellowship, which is a program that Network 2020 uses to target the countries of geopolitical interest and uh, to uh, search and look for the challenges and ways to help those countries emerge uh, uh, victorious, more sustainable, and more inclusive. Uh, we have been, like Courtney also said, uh, first doing virtual interviews where we really wanted to understand the social and the economic dynamics uh, shaping Tunisia and then decided to deepen that knowledge with the, the on the ground portion of the program where we had the chance of having the delegates. And uh, again, like Courtney stated, uh, Network 2020 is neutral and it gets to keep its uh, natural, uh, neutrality by uh, uh, investing in uh, innovative financing schemes so the delegates not only funded uh, their trips but were also able uh, to find uh, to fund uh, our uh, research where we got the chance to meet with over uh, 30 actors uh, spanning key industries and uh, sectors uh, we went to meet them in the northwest in the southwest in the northeast uh, had the coast near uh, uh, source and um, uh, those people uh, that we met have marked us, as you can see in our next slide, because uh, first we realized that no matter where you come from, no matter uh, uh, your background, whether you are uh, a university uh, uh, graduate or uh, uh, an artist, everyone was looking uh, uh, to become an expatriate or uh, an immigrant uh, uh, abroad. Uh, there was a tangible, uh, a tangible lack of hope within Tunisian youth, and we also realized that although the Tunisian context is very specific, its youth, its uh, population, its uh, activists know its problems by hand and know how they can solve it. So one of the key quotes that we also got out of this uh, trip is that the solution is Tunisia. So um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, before, um, uh, because the Entrepreneurial Diplomacy Fellowship was a learning curve for us, we first starting, uh, started our thinking by uh, fixating more onto democracy and its mechanisms and the fact that it was a nation democracy, but really realized that the real question was about social and economic integration and inclusion. And this is why we have decided that our guiding line would be on financing, supporting, and encouraging this then the key question that we kept asking ourselves in the next slide, please, was how might we empower, support, and scale local community initiatives in under-resourced regions across Tunisia to foster economic uh, growth and reduce regional disparities? So we started with question. I was initially the very first and the only Tunisia advisor that the 2020 had, but along our uh, uh, trip, we had the chance to meet wonderful individuals who gave, gave us very valuable advice on how we should uh, proceed and how we could uh, make uh, Tunisia more socially inclusive. And this is where we met Leila Ben Gesem, who was going to talk to us about uh, the different workshops that we had following uh, the trip to reach the phase of the RFP. Uh, the floor is yours, Leila. Thank you. Thank you, Badis. Uh, thank you, Courtney, for inviting me to this meeting. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, after I will uh, take on after Badis, what the, the, the travel to Tunisia that Badis described, uh, we had a series of uh, online um, uh, calls where um, uh, social, uh, uh, civil, civil society representatives from many parts of Tunisia were invited to present the case, uh, I mean, the case on the ground, how things look like, where they are, and what are the challenges facing um, the communities, the neighborhoods. And um, despite a um, variety of, of challenges, which are, of course, region-based, um, most uh, were focused on um, giving hope, the lack of hope or the lack of meaning for young people. I mean, it, 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 it comes, 
it comes from various reasons that uh, most of the people who who contributed to these talks um, agreed on. Um, there's the old school education system. There's the um, despite uh, Tunisia being a new democracy, and uh, we do feel um, some degrees of freedom of uh, expression, which which is still is still there. Um, there's uh, um, a lot of um, liberty in uh, in cri cri political critique. Uh, but the, the economic democracy did not uh, did not really take off, and this is this is why, as Badis explained, uh, sadly, a lot of young people um, their best dream is to uh, to migrate legally or illegally, um, and uh, this is this is where um, where we try to uh, rethink what could be the uh, the best. Uh, way forward and uh, and how uh, collaborations could be developed or initiatives to to create um, maybe new opportunities and it does not need to be uh, sometimes it does not need to be a very big project sometimes young people who who take on um, some uh, modest initiatives in their regions and uh, create opportunities for themselves and others um, can really uh, create hope uh, in their communities and uh, inspire others to to take on the same um, the same opportunities. Uh, sometimes people talk of Tunisian youth as uh, uh, they are not risk takers, but uh, then when you when you see the number of young people who are uh, throwing themselves to into migration, and I mean there's no risk more than that. I mean you, so uh, so it's not it's not that they are risk adverse. It's that they um, there are no uh, um, the, the economy is not supporting them. There is no financial. Uh, the, the, the financial system does not believe in giving uh, youth um, the means uh, to explore um, their uh, their ideas or, or whatever they want to do to uh, to help themselves um, create economic opportunities for themselves and for the communities. Uh, and so these were the the. It's a little bit of a summary of all the uh, the opportunities that were. Um, or the challenges, I, I should say, that were highlighted by uh, many civil society representatives from uh, different parts of Tunisia. And I think this is where um, uh, Courtney wanted to, to lead us today through this uh, RFP and uh, the, the whole, all the ideas that, uh, that we have brainstormed to, that led to this RFP idea is, is, uh, is coming out from all the various um, uh, ground uh, feedbacks um and the challenges that uh, that were highlighted during um, uh, the interactions that we've had the last Courtney, I forgot a few months it was it was a uh, more than three or four months I think yes yeah yeah we did it over the course of a few months yeah. good is that um Layla is that a wrap for you are you uh yes uh you let me know if i forgot something i can go on forever <laughs> <laughs> I, I i think it was great i think that that that's a good point to um turn it back over to leah now so awesome. um, thank you so much both badis and layla because when we think about this work uh, none of it would be possible uh without the leadership that you both provide in your own communities, in your own work, um, and globally. And so having you as partners in this journey has been incredible. Uh, from Badis, who originally introduced us to our first colleagues and our first interviews, uh, to Layla. And Layla is representing a team of about 15 advisors uh, who are across the country of Tunisia, who have really informed us. And going back to the truth of you know, there's so much opportunity to create hope. There's so much power in young people and the solution really is Tunisian. And so when we realized, you know, we have this pool of 20,000 US dollars for funding, our team thought we could do something, but that doesn't make any sense. What makes the most sense is making sure that this funding is in the hands of the leaders and the innovators and uh, the individual entrepreneurs in Tunisia who can actually make a difference. And 
That is what we were able to determine with the support of uh, this advisory committee. And so thank you so much, Layla, for your leadership that has helped us to get here. Um, so just really switching gears to talk about this funding opportunity. Uh, one, we do have a total of 20,000 US dollars. I will name that that is for one project at this point. Uh, so we will be seeking applications and reviewing applications in this funding realm, um, but we want to make sure that we connect everyone who applies uh, with a community of advisors. If they are thinking about launching their projects, um, please be in touch with the Network 2020 community uh, because it is a resourceful community. And so while we have some funding, there's also a large community of advisors and support and mentors in this space. Um, and then the one other thing that is important to us is while we traveled throughout Tunisia, we went to the north, we went to the south, you know, we were able to see so many different parts of the country, and we are really hoping to focus on regions uh, across Tunisia. And so if you represent uh, somewhere outside of Tunis or a population or an individuals uh, throughout the country, those are the folks that we want to hear from. Uh, how can we empower leaders in what we have identified as three impact areas? So when you read the RFP proposal, you're going to see that you can choose one of these three impact areas. Uh, these were helped developed by our advisory committee where we saw the most need, but also the most deep opportunity uh, for a short-term project, uh, for a pilot launch. And so you don't have to have a project that focuses on all three of these. You can choose just one. So the first one is short-term skills training. So think of these as maybe it's a project that helps to develop a certain set of workplace skills or skills for a specific job. Um, it could also be something that looks at providing an internship uh, for individuals within a region in, in Tunisia, um, an on-the-job training or a mentorship program. So the first one is really, is there a training that you would like to be providing to individuals in Tunisia? The second is thinking about the entrepreneurial mindset. So one of the things that we learned is that there are so many folks, particularly young people who are attending boot camps and uh, startups. We learned so much about the startup back in Tunisia, but we learned that these are also skills that everyone needs throughout their career and throughout their opportunities. And so we're looking at projects that help to train or support an entrepreneurial mindset, um, whether that's thinking about building skills for innovation, opportunities with projects focused on a growth mindset or leadership or project management, all of those skills that you need to be an entrepreneur, but might not be somebody who says, I want a large scale startup tomorrow. Um, so if there's a project that focuses on that, we would love to hear from you. And then finally, we're looking at impact for community leadership. Uh, one thing that we learned was that so many, uh, so much of the impactful, powerful work happening in Tunisia is because of, as Layla said, you know, one person putting forth a small effort and then galvanizing and leading others throughout their community. And so we're looking at projects that can help support and train that local leader. Uh, maybe it's community leadership as a coalition or maybe it's a leadership training. Uh, we know that this is something that is important. And what we've seen to really create long-term change is investing particularly in our young people and those leadership skills. So the application is going to ask you, and what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is the first part of the application where we will ask you a little bit about yourself. Uh, so who you are as an applicant, but also because we have funding that is in US dollars, uh, we want to make sure that there is a financial sponsor organization uh, who can help to track that funding. And we wanna make sure that it gets to you and doesn't get caught up elsewhere. Uh, so we are looking for a financial sponsor organization. If you do not have that, that's okay. 
reach out to us and we will help kind of talk through uh, some of the NGOs that we know that might be able to sponsor you. Um, so the second thing that we will ask in the application is project details. Uh, so this is naming that impact area, one of the three that I mentioned before, the project goals and any work that you have done to date. Uh, and then finally, we have some design criteria that we will ask you just to talk about. And so this is thinking about, is this a new project? Is this a long-term project? Um, what are some of the ways that you are thinking about other regions? Uh, making sure that you are focused on the folks who need support the most. And then after you get through that first part of the application, uh, for successful candidates, we'll start to ask about how we will measure outcomes and we'll start to ask about budgets. We do have some budget templates to help outline where the funding might be coming from and what you might need uh, to actually be asking for for payment as we go through. Uh, $20,000 20, US dollars, we hope will go a long way, uh, but that budget planning process will be something that we'll want to talk about too. One quick note is that this funding opportunity, this RFP is not for only international travel. So we are not looking for projects to say, take three people to uh, France for one week to learn a skill. Uh, so we wanna be clear on that. Uh, this is not funding just for a staff salary. So if you run an NGO or run an organization and you say 20,000 $20, US dollars might help support somebody in a new job. Um, so we don't want to be just paying for somebody to go to work. Uh, we want to be paying for something like a training program or a broader program, and not for just one single event. So if those are the ways that you're thinking, reach out to us and we'll help think through a different type of, a, of project that will help you get to the goals that you have. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dario, who is going to talk us through the phases of the application and our timeline. Thank you, Leah. Um, so our application phases, um, many of you already have these dates, but just a reminder where the application is live and we are now accepting applications until September 1st. So you have 30 full days to work on your application, submit it, share it with others in your ecosystem. Um, and then in September um, for round two, phase two, we're calling it, uh, we'll ask you to provide budget details, provide extra project details about who you're serving, why, um, and other details. So please um, think about carefully what you're proposing to do, how much does it cost, who's involved, and your direct impact to your community. Phase three will entail an interview with Network 2020 and our committee of Tunisians. And so we'll ask you to join us for a brief interview where we dig deeper into what you're proposing and your, your projected outcomes. By the end of October, we're anticipating on contacting our awardees. Um, and that will be a very exciting time for our team to um, have our final selected projects. Thank you. Uh, next slide. And so just really quickly, you know, this is a number one question, I'm sure for many of you, what is a successful project? Here's where, you know, you get together with your team and think about the proposal very clearly. Um, here, we like to make sure that what you're proposing matches well with the problem and the solution. Um, why you and your team are the right people to be doing this, that you have a very good knowledge of the ecosystem, who the competitors are, what hasn't been achieved or completed in Tunisia, um, what's your unique competitive advantage, how is this project going to be sustainable, right? So thinking about carefully, how are you going to meet certain criteria and so that the project um, continues on well past the funding. And so just being very thoughtful about that is very important. Um, your milestones here, just really carefully plan out in your proposal. We'd like to see that you have carefully thought about what your um, goals and objectives are by, let's say, three months into the project, six months. Um, here is where you're, you'll be very clear about what tools you'll need 
And then just a final point about understanding your ecosystem and community. Um, we like to see that you are well aware of um, your audience, your community, um, and how you're really empowering and supporting the Tunisian workforce. Um, as Leila said earlier, you know, no project is modest. We really are looking for people that are really thoughtful and have um, thought about um, how can they fit in, whether it's the migration issue with youth, how are you thinking about empowering um, voices that are um, have not been brought to the table? So um, feel free to reach out to us with more questions like this. And we actually have a Q&A coming up so we can go in further. Um, thank you, Leah. And with that, I'll pass it over to Fashea. Thanks, Dario. So I just want to briefly summarize what we're looking for in the applicant themselves, just so that we're being fully transparent in what we're looking for. And this is all based on what we shared with you in the beginning, the research that we did leading up to the project, um, the research we did on the ground, as well as the feedback we heard from our advise, uh, advisory group. And these details are also outlined on our website. We're looking for the lead applicant to be within a particular age range, 21 to 35 years old. Ideally, you'll be connected to a legal entity that is based in Tunisia and had been in operation for a couple of years. We also would like to know that you're being appropriately led and advised as you work through this project. And so if you can identify a one project advisor or mentor, um, that would be really helpful in your application and strengthen it quite a bit. We also want to know that you have a team because it's very difficult to execute something of this scale um, on your own and that those roles are clearly defined. We also want to know that you can receive funding from an organization like Network 2020. Sometimes the financial side of these things can get a bit technical and we just wanna make sure that um, transfer of funds at any point throughout the project is smooth. And then lastly, we wanna make sure that your project is impacting a region outside of Tunis, because we understand that uh, through our research, um, impact is important. And we wanna make sure that regions that are typically under-resourced, under-serviced um, are being given the opportunity to benefit from an opportunity like this one. Uh, we'll jump to the next slide where I just wanna briefly describe um, what we define as impact. And what we're really encouraging you to do here is want to think about your proposal, but also think a bit more long term. What is the final outcome going to look like? And if you can think in terms of these four criteria, which we describe as connection, innovation, scalability, and transformation, we think that this would be a really successful project for you and the community that you hope to impact. When we're talking about connection, we want to know who are you connecting with through your project? Are you creating new connections? Are you invigorating old ones? Because that's equally important. What new voices and perspectives are being incorporated as you are facilitating this connection? When we talk about innovation, we want to know about what new ideas are, have come about either through your project or the people that you're impacting to come up with new ideas and thinking tangibly about the type of value that's being created for your community. We also are really encouraging scalability. We don't want to see a project that um, maybe only has short-term benefits, but um, can grow over time. So how will these ideas spread beyond the region that you're hoping to impact? How far reaching is it? And if you wanna be a bit more ambitious, thinking about what this project might look like in three to five or even 10 years down the line. Lastly, we wanna make sure we're emphasizing transformation. How different does my community look as a result of my project and who's benefiting the most from this work that I'm doing? We hope that by creating this kind of vision for yourself, it can excite you and energize you about this proposal and the project and allow you to be a bit more clear and um, ambitious in the way you design it and eventually execute. Um, I'll pass it on to my colleague and uh, uh, thank you. Awesome. So I see a couple of questions that have come through in the Q&A, and I am going to read them. And then if uh, somebody would like to answer them, that would be wonderful. Um, so once I have applied, can I edit my proposal? And I don't know, Brian, if that's um, something that from a technology side you are able to answer. So 
unfortunately, once you submit your proposal, you cannot edit it. Uh, but feel free to email us at information at network 2020.org if you need any help uh, to change the, your proposal. Uh, we can help you to update uh, your final proposal before present that to the selection committee. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. So reach out to us if you do need to, but please try your absolute best uh, to have a finished proposal uh, that you will not be planning on editing. Uh, so we recommend working offline, um, spending some time typing and iterating and editing uh, before you submit. And if you have questions before you submit, uh, do your best to, to ask them uh, and reaching out to the Network 2020 team. Um, do or What are you looking for with the supporting organization? Uh, who and what should that be? Uh, Courtney, do you want to take this? Sure, I'll take this one. And, and I'll give a little background too, just so people know why we have this question. So Network 2020 is a 501c3 uh, organization in the United States. So that's a section of the tax code. Um, so we're, we're getting a little technical here, but it means that for us to give funds to another organization, there are rules around that. And so we just need to be careful from our organizational standpoint about where the money goes. And then there's also this um, understanding that it can be helpful to have the infrastructure of a, of a larger organization if one is a small initiative. And so basically what we're looking for is um, a, a, an organization in Tunisia that is able to accept funds. So they have a legal status of, of a nonprofit um, or, the, um, or the equivalent. And they're physically, technically capable of receiving US dollars and that they would then distribute to your initiative um, with through whatever agreement that that you have come up with with them. Um, so basically, we're really looking for the legal status um, of an organization and, uh, and that they have the um, financial capability, the infrastructure to to be a sponsoring organization and pass along um, and pass along some of the. Uh, pass along the funds in a way that that makes sense. And ideally, if they're mission aligned, there can be benefits that are derived, right? So it might be that, um, you know, if your project is looking at um, leadership within a specific community, and perhaps they have ties to that community, you know, there, there, there can be side benefits. Um, it doesn't need to be that way. It could strictly be just a really a, a financial relationship, but often with sponsoring organizations, if there's an alignment, then it just makes your pathway that much easier. Um, and so that's that's really what we're looking for is, is the legal status and the technical capability to receive and pass along money. Um, does that make sense? Are there other um, things that people would add to that from our team based on our conversations? Great. Next question. Awesome. So the next question is, do I have to be living in Tunisia currently in order to apply? If I could jump in, um, I think we would like to see in our like applicant that they are based in Tunisia and actively working there. So I guess maybe at the time of applying and then I invite my colleagues to like add to this, you can be based anywhere, but for the duration of the, the project, we would like to see that you're actively working there and getting a sense of community needs. Um, we also um, expect that the organization you're affiliated with has been in operation for at least two years. And so I guess we would also like to see that there's work that has been done to some degree in Tunisia. Yeah, but, um, I'd invite Edelin to add on to that just so that it were clear. Sure, I, I can just add a word or two. Um, you know, please, um, if you are the person, a part of your organization that will be on the front lines of working on this project, that person should be the one applying. 
Um, we know you have a strong team in many different NGOs and many different sectors. However, we really want to hear from the folks that will be on the front lines with this project. So that may be your colleague or coworker. So just give that some thought um, as you prepare to apply on who will be the person on the ground from January through December, as Vishaya mentioned, um, and that person should be applying. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. And it, Dario, to your point, goes to the next question of, is there both a co-applicant and an advisor? What is the difference between the two? And this might actually be an excellent opportunity for somebody who has a co-applicant. If you are somebody living in the States or um, living abroad, uh, what you might be able to do is find a co-applicant who is living in Tunisia. So a co-applicant would also be somebody who is expected to be a project lead. And that person would have to also hit the requirements of the RFP. So be in the age demographic of 21 to 35. Uh, and so if there is an opportunity, you do not need a co-applicant, uh, but there is an opportunity if you would like to apply uh, as a pair, that is wonderful if you are interested in that. Um, and for somebody who might be located outside of Tunisia, it might be helpful to name a Tunisian-based co-applicant. Uh, and the difference between a co-applicant, again, a co-applicant would be doing the work uh, responsible for that reporting and fit the 21 to 35-year-old age demographic, where an advisor is somebody who is going to support, uh, to guide, and to mentor you within the project. Uh, so it's excellent for somebody who does not fit that age demographic or who isn't going to be really doing the hard work of implementation, but is somebody who's going to help you, give you feedback, uh, supervise you, and mentor you in this space. And, um, and just to add to that, um, the, the co-applicant as well can help with the, um, with the age restrictions around the lead applicant. Um, because the lead applicant does need to be between the ages of 21 and 35. And so the, the co, the, if, if the lead applicant is between those ages, but, you know, wants the expertise of someone else and partners with a co-applicant, that's another way to, again, just show that there are multiple people working on the project that they, you know, that we can fit the criteria of, you know, being in Tunisia, Tunisian led on the front lines within a certain age restriction with the certain um, capabilities. And so that's, that's why we have that piece. Awesome. And if there are, keep asking questions if anything remains unclear. Um, Courtney, can you speak to if advocacy projects are eligible? Uh, this is a great question. I think it, uh, I'm going to say it depends. Um, I think with anything, we want to make sure it falls within one of those three areas. Um, and again, we're, uh, as we say, and as Pashea said at the end, you know, we're really looking for what's the ultimate impact. Um, and so I think if you have questions about your project at the beginning, we would be very happy to, um, you know, particularly in the case of something like advocacy, if it, if you're curious as to whether or not it might be eligible, please just send us an email and we can talk through um, whether or not that would actually fit the bill or not. But because again, we're looking for those three areas and we're looking for the impact. Great. Um, I'm gonna take the next one. Can the project be working on developing an entrepreneurial mindset for a specific group such as artists or must it be a general population or general audience? Uh, this is a fantastic question. Uh, I think that it would be fabulous uh, to see uh, a proposal for a specific group. And we actually know that sometimes that's a lot more impactful because you can actually measure outcomes and have a clear understanding of what's going to happen. So yes, a specific group would be an excellent proposal. Um, the next question is around budget. So you mentioned a budget template. Is there a template for the statement and vision? Uh, could you describe what you're looking for? Uh, more about my personal passion or my future vision. Does anyone want to take this? Sure, I can start. Um, 
So in terms of an actual template for the application, so for the phase one application, there are a series of about four questions, which are 250 words each. So we give you a lot of space to think about each question. So the main questions are, what is the project overview? Um, what efforts have you made? Um, the impact you're having on the, pe the people or location or community? And then what do you hope will change? So in terms of these open-ended questions, we are giving you space to really tell us why this is an important piece of work and how this connects with either a community, with empowering Tunisian workforce. Um, as Leah presented, we have three focus areas. Please take a look at those. Um, it's, on our, it's on our application. Um, but really, you know, more, more so than just your personal passion or future vision, we really want to understand that your organization that you're with is also connected with doing, um, having a big impact. Um, so just carefully think about, you know, why are you the right person or team to be providing this goal? Um, and again, really being realistic about what you can do in one year's time with the funding provided. Um, anything else from our other panelists? One thing I might add is also being conscious of like what the need is, because we hope to see a project that is responsive to the needs of the group or community that you're targeting. So if that can come through in your application, I think that would be really, really helpful to make your case and demonstrate, you know, passion and, and the ear to the ground that you have. Thank you, guys. Um, how many projects will be funded? I'll take that one. So I think right now we have up to $20,000 in funding. That's generally the size of the projects that we're looking for, um, perhaps a bit under that. Um, so I think at this time, we're just funding one. Um, however, if it's successful, maybe this is something that that could continue. But um, but right now we're we're looking ideally just for one. And does my application need to be written in English? I can take that one too. Um, because the review committee, and we haven't talked about the review committee at all, but because the review committee, um, while it consists of people from Tunisia, it will also consist of native English speakers. So yes, we would like the application to be written in English. And the project duration. So we are looking at an ideal January 2024 start date, and we're hoping for a project that will last for one year. Um, Dario, did you have any other insights? I know you've been looking at the timeline. Uh, you know, in terms of the project duration, as Leah said, one year is what we're looking at. Um, however, Please, um, within that one year, we also, if you think you're, you know, we want you to have milestones. And so keeping um, your goals and intentions realistic throughout that period is important. Um, in fact, we actually will ask you, how are you evaluating that you're doing a good job? How is this project? How are you deeming it to be successful? Uh, so that's just really important to consider. Great question. Thank you, Dario. Um, and is there a preferred region or regions that you would like to focus on? I'm not sure. So I, or, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I can jump in and Layla and Fashea, please jump in if you have any thoughts. But, you know, when we started with Network 2020, I think we learned that there are many different problems in the country and they affect different parts of the country differently from the interior to the coastal region. So we really want to see that you understand that the people that are closest to the problem are the people that you're trying to serve, right? And so in understanding the interior, um, whether that's in the Northwest or in the South of the country, that's very important to consider. Um, so please let us know, you know, if you're working on youth and workforce problems, let us know what is the data point around that in, in terms of the location that you're serving. Um, Layla, do you have anything else? I know 
I know you have done so much great work in this space for many, many years, um, both within Tunis and outside of Tunis. Now, I think again, I want to uh, I want to say again what I kind of said earlier on. Uh, there's, I mean, there's the, I I believe in small, simple ideas that have very big impact and and snowball and create big opportunities. I think we sometimes underestimate the the uh, uh, the opportunities of our territories, of our regions, and uh, you know, it could be an ancestral know. How it could be uh, um, storytelling, it could be marketing our region, it could be, I don't want to give ideas, I'm trying to stop myself, but it's so hard. <laughs> but uh, I think I think uh, a lot of young people are very creative, and I'm sure a lot of great stories will come out. Um, but uh, I encourage people not to not to make it too complicated, just, you know, um, uh, most important is impact. Um, I think you need to think of uh, impact and how it could be inclusive and how it could create a positive story um, for the applicant and for the region and um, um, create, uh, you know, think think small, think small for this project, but think of it as something that can grow uh, and impact a lot more people in the future and create, uh, create a whole new dynamic, uh, probably. So, um, um i don't know dario uh is this okay <laughs> yes yes that i think um you know i think one thing fashia mentioned earlier is being innovative right and being bold with mm -hmm. your your thinking asking the right questions um so really you know think be innovative with this application we we've seen many different projects in tunisia and so if you see that there's a gap in the market we want to hear from those kinds of ideas so be very creative thank you Layla. Fantastic. And I think the only other question we did speak to was about the co-applicant and the advisor. Uh, so a co-applicant would be ready to do the work um, and actually part of the interview process and part of the evaluation process. And an advisor would be supporting, mentoring, supervising, and guiding. Uh, so you do not need both of them. Um, and if you have any questions as you're thinking about naming a co-applicant or looking for an opportunity to expand your network of advisors, please do reach out. And I know that that looks as if it is all of our questions in the Q&A box. Um, are there any, is there anyone who wants to share anything else that we may have missed, maybe Badis or Layla or Courtney? Uh, thank you. Uh, so maybe what I would like to add is to really uh, emphasize uh, the need to really uh, take into account the different elements of the uh, uh, Harapi and to try as much of the uh, conditions as possible uh, to say that again, uh, we are a natural NGO, we really care about impact and we want uh, to fund a project that would be sustainable, that would be impactful, and that could really and uh, tangibly uh, make Tunisia more inclusive. So thank you all for your time and that would be it for me. Thank you, Leia. Thank you. And also I did just notice in the chat box, there is one more question. So apologies. Um, how do you evaluate gaps and needs in education and Tunisia? And one thing I will say is that this is where our team of advisors has come in very handy. Uh, so we have folks who are education experts uh, working on global education and local education. Uh, and workforce development experts as part of that team of advisors who have been helping us, and they will be part of the evaluation process. Um, but Leila or Courtney, is there anything you wanted to add to uh, this excellent question that's in the chat box? No, I think um, I, I think you covered it. I think it's you know that it, it's the advisors that we have um, on the ground. And, and I think it also, to a certain extent, it, it comes from the applicants as well, right? Um, so if you are in a particular region, uh, you know, it's the, the, the gaps in education are not going to be uniform. Um, and so if you know 
what's happening on the ground in your community, um, and you can highlight that and, and document that in a way, then then it it informs all of us too. So it, it's a two way street. Wonderful, thank you. And so in the chat box, uh, my colleague Brian has shared the link to the application. This session has been recorded and we do uh, please share it widely, uh, share the link to the RFP with anyone you know who might be interested in and please share uh, this opportunity as much as you can. Uh, we will have a link to this recording uh, feel free to post it with your friends or reach out to Network 2020 uh, through the website if there are any questions that come up as you're applying. Thank you so much for your leadership uh, in Tunisia and around the world. We truly appreciate each and every one of you uh, for learning more about us in this opportunity today. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Good luck and we look forward to the applications. Thank you.